Welcome. Good afternoon. Is there anybody in the class that wasn't here yesterday? Anybody? No? Oh, you. Okay. There is actually, uh, this lecture is being given by Professor Onur Mutlu. I'm just filling in for today. Okay. Don't worry. There will be a proper professor the next time you're in class. Uh, also, for the rest of you, um, if you, um, you know, if you looked at this first two hours and now today and say, yeah, there's really no point in coming to class, maybe give it another try next week when, you know, there is a, a more competent <laughs> representation. Okay, I, I see there are enough places actually here. Is there the other classroom, I believe? There are people there, right? Uh, there is, I don't know, Gefus Mesic, 50 places here available. We are all having fun here, incredibly. So you can come over. OK, anyway. Uh, so we are still trying to motivate why we are, um, uh, why we are giving this lecture. And today, um, we want to talk about a little bit more. Yesterday, we said it's important that we have these abstraction levels. But it's important to see beyond these abstraction levels. And uh, just to start the lecture, uh, we have to do a very quick recap. Uh, we were talking that we have these problems, and the problems needed solving because we wanted a better world. Some people said, hey, I don't care about that. I want to make money. Whatever your motivation is, we have the problems. And we know that by orchestrating the electrons, somehow we are going to get uh, the problem solved. We say that for doing that way, there is algorithms which describe us a step-by-step -step way of solving those problems. And if we have them, if we can develop them, we can also implement them on computers uh, by using uh, programming languages, which run on some system software that allows your um, programs also access to the resources. In the next step, uh, this system software is somehow being um, converted to a language that the hardware can understand, and there is the interface between the software and hardware. This is an, um, a contract between uh, the, let's say, software world, computer science world, and the hardware world, the electrical engineering world, in uh, both sides agreeing, OK, we are going to have a system that is going to have the following alphabet. It will understand the following commands, have following capabilities. The next step is the microarchitecture. So once you have defined and said that I want a processor that has 32 registers, it has 47 bits, it uh, understands 15 uh, different commands, and here are their descriptions, etc., which will all be described in this lecture as well, uh, you start implementing it. And then your implementation also takes a physical form. So uh, from an abstract description, it becomes something that has physical properties. It consumes energy. It occupies a circuit area. It can only work at a certain speed. We talked about uh, why do we worry about these things. The circuit area roughly corresponds to how much that uh, circuit will cost. It, has, it relates to the uh, production cost, manufacturing cost of the thing, plus there are some uh, at the moment, some limits. We cannot make chips much larger than they are. So, you know, we are forced to also stay within the bounds of reality. Energy has become a very big issue. You are building a data center. You say, hey, let's get 10,000 computers, stick it in a room, let's calculate. Uh, all of a sudden, you realize um, the room is getting really, really warm in there. And uh, you realize that when you switch on the power, uh, half the city block uh, disappears from the grid. And so um, energy becomes important. Frequency or the operation speed is always interesting because you want things to run faster, better, nicer, or you want to have your products uh, uh, sold as such. And underneath there, you have the uh, logic gates. These are basic building blocks. And uh, these building blocks use some devices, which in turn, at the moment, still use electrons as their main way of transport. So if you look at the computer architecture, most computer architecture books that you're looking at will be concentrating on the software hardware interface and will be having discussions about the microarchitecture, which is not bad. I mean, you need to know this. There's no way 
No, there's no way. Of course, you can ignore everything you want, but this thing is um, uh, necessary to understand how to work with computers. What we want to today also emphasize is that you need to have a much broader view, uh, like we are highlighting here, so that you can understand some of the modern uh, problems better and uh, not stay in the abstractions that we have discussed, but also be able to you know, switch to different abstraction levels so that you can understand what are the problems and how can I solve them, because this is ultimately what we are interested in. So crossing the abstraction layers, we talked about this uh, yesterday. So as long as everything goes well, you are happy with your programs, algorithms, you're solving the uh, issues, your computers don't have, uh, or your, the programs you develop don't have any problems, there are no security breaches, nothing, 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 it's not a problem. But the moment you realize that um, uh, you are lit hitting some limits, it's the programs are not running as fast as you would like, or you are, you're seeing something, there is no bugs or no um, algorithmic problems in the way you're approaching the problem, but still the implementation does not satisfy you. It's not good enough. It's not fast enough. And then you realize with the knowledge in your abstraction level, there is no explanation of it. You try to access data from the memory, and it is slow. Uh, you know that basically from what you learned, there should be a cache hierarchy and things like that, but it is slower than what it should be, and you have no idea why. And to be able to work in these situations and, uh, or uh, you, uh, you, you could also be on the other side. So this is more the side where you're looking from a software point of view. You could also look at it from the other side when you are interacting with people who are designing the hardware and they design these fantastic ideas, or so they think, uh, but nobody can make use of them because you don't know how to interact with those things. So, uh, what I want to do today in these two hours is uh, look at four distinct problems that were only solved because uh, the people working on it were able to break the abstraction layers and were able to look behind it. And I want to illustrate these problems and why it is important on these things that are uh, part of also Professor Mutlu's research in the last 10 years. And, uh, before you ask some, I, I had a lot of questions about the reading assignments. And uh, at the end of the reading assignments, there are problems. So the moment they see reading assignment, everybody wants to solve all the problems. Who solved all the problems? <laughs> and nobody, everybody was asking me this question. Okay. Uh, so uh, there will be optional homeworks. Uh, and these will be stated clearly and uh, given uh, on the course website. Uh, the idea is uh, when, we are, um, when we are talking about the lecture, there's a reading assignment that explains these things also in the book so you can follow the ideas that we discuss here. And it helps you, the reading assignments help you to uh, prepare for the exam eventually to understand and to read further about what we are discussing here. And uh, we are also, and today we will see a lot of it, uh, we are also talking about topics uh, that are not necessarily relevant for your exam. But the topics are interesting. I mean, if you want to study computer science, not everybody will be completely in love with these topics, we understand. But it, they are things that bother us uh, research-wise, and there are interesting approaches to it. And uh, feel free to in get inspired. And if you go on the web and type Google, I want to know what Meltdown and Spectre is, you're probably going to get a million hits. And uh, some of them will undoubtedly be good explanations and things like that, but Professor Mutlu already provides you some, um, how shall I say, pre-selected good references that you can uh, read and learn more from. So I think uh, try to see it that way. Hey, that's a service that's being offered to us. Take advantage of it if you want or say, no, it's not affecting my grade, I'm not looking at it. Can we edit that? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so we are going to talk about four things. Let's start with Meltdown and Spectre. Everybody heard it? Yeah, the others are just too lazy to raise their arms. It's kind of interesting, actually. It's the same problem, or it's a very similar problem that manifests itself in two different things and was uh, developed or um, two different groups worked on it and they exploited it slightly differently 
That's why it's meltdown in spectre and not just spectre and not just meltdown. Uh, but the underlying principle is the same. Uh, we asked about it yesterday, so there is some, uh, what's, the, what's the issue? And this is crazy, actually. If you think about it, um, you were alive in, uh, during 2000, right? Barely. <laughs> yeah. uh, did, you read, did you hear something about the Y2K problem? Why 2K problem? But you didn't, I mean, you didn't experience it, right? I mean, it was really like doomsday. People were saying, oh my God, the world is going to end. Did you stock enough? I mean, people were really stockpiling things. It was crazy. And uh, there was such a hysteria about it. And it's actually very interesting that there wasn't the same hysteria about this because Y2K was more, of, more or less like there. But this thing is actually very serious. So uh, look at this. Someone can steal secret data from the system, even though your program and data are perfectly correct. You made no mistake, there are no bugs. You're not exploiting problems in the way you have written your program. There are no buffer overflows, undefined behavior, or anything else lurking in your program. I mean, they might still be there, but this, uh, this issue is not about it. Your hardware was designed perfectly. There are no secret nations entering your computer, building in backdoors, trying to steal your very important stuff, okay? The hardware is, for the discussion of this attack, made according to the specification. There's nothing wrong with it. And there are no software vulnerabilities in the kernel, in the system, in the program that you are using, in the way the network is connected, nothing. Everything, uh, is working perfectly according to the book, but still someone can steal secret data. It's crazy. What can you do against this? I mean, you know, uh, what's, your pro what's the problem? What did we do wrong? Why are we being punished? Why are evil people taking over our uh, very secret data? Spotify playlist. <laughs> so, the thing is also much more severe in which it's not like a very obscure, you know, all the MacBook Airs manufactured between 17th of November and 18th of uh, November are vulnerable. No, it's actually almost all computer chips that were manufactured in the past two decades. Ouch, everything that we have is vulnerable. And the moment that they said, uh, we found this, uh, you know, there was also no uh, certain solution to it. It's, it's really a gigantic, oh my God, what did we do kind of thing. So they exploit speculative execution. So this is lying in behind it. And it is uh, a technique that we employ in high performance processors. Why? Because you built your processor. We were talking last, uh, yesterday about the criteria. You know, there was these two uh, railway stations and we wanted to decide which one was better. And one of the criteria that people look in a processor is, how fast does it work? And if you put importance to how fast does it work, we will try to do our best to make that it works much faster. So speculative execution is doing something before you know that it is actually needed. And uh, we do it all the time in life. Does anybody have an example? Yeah? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, you say, I don't know what will come in the exam. If I knew, I would just study for this question. But I, I will study everything for everything. I'll be ready. Uh, another one? More like, not exam, school, daily life. Yeah, sorry. Yes, that's also a good one. I can give you another example. You, uh, you want to meet a few friends. You don't know how many are coming, so you call the, uh, the restaurant, the hotel, wherever, and you say, I want to reserve for 10 people already. And then your friends just takes you, nah, not in the mood. And then two hours later, you call the restaurant and say, yeah, nobody's coming, let's cancel it. You know, that, we do that sort of thing all the time. So processors also try to do it. And uh, it's not because they are, uh, they are doing something evil, 
but uh, they want to improve the performance. Here's a very, very simple example. Uh, you have something like this um, in some imaginary language, and you want to query your account balance. How much money do I have? And uh, you know, you do different things if you are negative, if you have less than one million, and if you have more than one million. Okay, and the uh, problem is, just imagine for the sake of argument that querying the account balance takes a really, really long time. I mean, in computer processing terms, not in our normal lifetime. And you know, you have two options. Either you could wait until the account balance comes back, you have the number, and then you can act upon that number and make your decision. Or you can say, you know what? There are three options what will happen, okay? Instead of waiting, let me assume that, what's the most likely thing here in your bank account? <laughs> no? Okay, with me, it's more like in the top level. So you can already start doing it without committing it. And if the account balance comes and you are right, your guess was right, you can just, I mean, you've already done the work, you've already reserved the restaurant, you can just go and sit down there. If not, I mean, it's not different than anything else. The moment the account balance comes, most of the time has already been spent. If you were right in your guess, you can continue doing what you, you wanted to do. If not, it's no different than first waiting for the account balance to arrive and then making your choice. So you just ignore what you did and uh, say, hey, I'll do it. And if you're good at your speculations, uh, you'll improve performance. Uh, there are simple things in a program when you are, for example, doing a loop. Uh, you say 4i or whatever range is, 0, 100. You're doing this. You'll be looping around 99% of the time, and you'll be not taking the other branch only 1% of the time. So 99% of the time, you'll be right. Uh, and if you look at the advantages, it pays off. So the speculative execution actually is invisible to the user. This is one of the problems. This is also why it became a problem. If you look here, this is your software hardware interface. This is the microarchitecture. Where is the speculative execution done? Who says in the software hardware interface? No, you're not very clear. Who says in the microarchitecture? <laughs> okay, what do the others say? <laughs> the electrons, the evil electrons do it. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a part of the microarchitecture. It's part of how we interpret uh, the things. So the ISA actually uh, tells you what the programmer assumes the hardware will do. It's, it's a contract. As a software engineer, you look at it and you say, hey, okay, the hardware will execute this thing. Uh, the programmer assumes their code will be executed in the order and in the style you have done. Whereas while you are doing the microarchitecture, you try to implement this, and uh, there might be competitors. You want to make a better processor. You want to look good in these uh, um, online comparisons of perf performance in Anantec or whatever, you want to have high grades, so you try to get performance wherever you can. And the microarchitecture realizes, hey, I can execute things in different order, I can execute things speculatively, but the results will be just like the programmer expects. They don't know that I am you know, doing two things in parallel and picking the best one, or I'm just assuming this will be it. And unless I make a mistake, I keep doing it, so I'm way ahead of time. I'm like a seer, an oracle. And uh, Meltdown and Spectre rely on this thing. So this is the problem. This is how it manifests itself. And this is the question, why? Because while the speculative execution works well, it improves the performance, it leaves some evidence. It leaves some traces that can be recovered. So what happens is, it leaves some data in the processor's cache. We will learn about how caches work and, and things like that. It's the internal storage of the processor, 
And it brings data that was not supposed to be there if, you know, we were not speculating. And, well, say, so who cares? We call these things uh, actually side, in, side channel information. This is additional information on what is going on inside the processor that you normally wouldn't have. A malicious program can somehow inspect the contents of the cache. They can realize that uh, this particular data is in the cache and uh, realize, aha, uh -huh, I know what's in the cache now. And what's even worse, a malicious program that is running inside your program can force another program to speculatively execute code that leaves some traces in the cache. Now, the technical details of it are maybe a little bit too, um, uh, I mean, there is, there is some work in it if you want to, to uh, really exploit it. It doesn't go with um, two lines of code, let's say. But the, the problem is the processor cache acts as a side channel. That means while it is correct with respect to the specification, there is evidence uh, in the caches of your speculative behavior. And this speculative behavior can be observed by someone else who's not associated with your program. It's another program running on the same processor. And uh, we say that the processor cache leaks information and the clever attacker can make use of this. He can, for example, how do you make use of this? You want to access some data and you realize the data comes to you very fast. What does it mean? The data didn't come from the main memory. It was already close to the processor. It was in the cache. So you realize this data block was already in the cache. Now I know that the other program made an access that brought this into my uh, cache. And, and a clever attacker can, you know, we are pretty smart if it comes to mischief, actually. And we can do a lot of funny things. And this was done uh, by different groups. So people at Google were doing it. And, uh, and, and they were able to, sorry, let me just go back. Uh, they were able to read privileged memory with a side channel. Privileged memory is your user program should not have had access to that part of the memory, the page table, for example. But they were able to gain that information, later use that information to also gain privileged access. But if you don't know, how the processor executes a program, how can we reason about this problem? Or how can we fix the problem if you don't know what was causing it in the first place? And uh, there is, you realize in these days, I mean, there was a nice old time where things were much simpler. Unfortunately, these days, finding a fix to these uh, problems and not a short-term fix, not a simple thing like disconnect from the internet, go to the mountains and live a life as a hermit, you know, kind of thing. But, solving a problem fundamentally, we have to know uh, both things. And can I construct this attack just to understand what is happening and trying to find some, some uh, solutions to it or der derivatives of it without knowing what is happening underneath? So here is then the other problem. Uh, speculative execution causes this. So if we, how can we, and where should we attack? Where should we make our changes? Shall we change the software, operating system, the ISA, microarchitecture? Should we have a collection of them done cooperatively? And, uh, you know, just getting, what happens if I get rid of speculative execution? Any idea? Yeah? The processor will get slower. Uh, the processor will get slower, yeah. You're telling the world, it's okay, we can get rid of it. If everything runs 40% slower and you're okay with it, let's do it. And all of a sudden, people say, ah, no, that's not really what I want. I paid you good money to give me, you know, the computer. So make it work well. So how do we do this if we are not getting out of it? So it's, again, the same uh, story. If you are just stuck here, Spectre and Meltdown don't exist. You have to be able to break the abstraction levels, and knowing what is underneath will enable you to understand and solve the problems. This is why we are uh, so much discussing this. And of course, we like XKCD comics. And uh, this one is cute because it has both Spectre Meltdown and our next topic, Raw Hammer. And I like that. Do we just suck at computers? At the moment, yes. Okay. 
No? Somebody said, uh-huh. Everything okay? Okay, I assume that people are ready. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, is, this is a problem that still stays on, and it's a very annoying problem if you, are, uh, if you get in the middle of it. Uh, we were trying to evaluate what is good and what is bad. Uh, I told you yesterday, it's not that simple. So the mindset that brought us speculative execution was uh, concentrated on making sure that we have a high performance and low energy uh, processor, and uh, this is what resulted in it. If we did not think about, we were not aware of this problem until somebody made it, and uh, it wasn't a constraint. So you can also not really blame the people who were doing the processors and things like that. Why were they so stupid? It's obvious. It wasn't obvious. I mean, it's a fairly, um, uh, a fairly uh, complex way of uh, attacking systems. But uh, now that you realize these are problems, you will uh, probably have different constraints, and there's a lot of research going on how we can reduce the side channel in processors and uh, uh, make in the future more secure things. Will it solve the problems? No, I can guarantee you we will have other nightmare scenarios like this coming up continuously. It's our job. This is why we are learning this. This is why we want to solve this. We want to stay ahead of the problems. If we, we are not giving up, but we want to, we need to be able to think critically, and we need to uh, look at the problems in a more broader uh, scale. Now, this is where you shouldn't be afraid if you want to learn more. Uh, there are uh, videos, especially the one by Red Hat, and uh, you can, uh, we will also come back to these topics later on when we are discussing how processors work internally. Uh, you can also talk with Professor Mutlu in the future because he has many theses in bachelor's and master's levels on hardware security and uh, fundamentally secure computing architectures is something that he does for research. So, mystery number one is gone. Now number two, row hammer. In the end, we are going to have a quiz which mystery you liked more. No? <laughs> I am really afraid that next lecture there will be like five people sitting here. <laughs> okay. Rohammer is, uh, or it's called DRAM disturbance uh, error, is uh, another one of those interesting things. It's a simple hardware failure mechanism, namely that the, um, the uh, information in a memory, in a dynamic memory, is not stored so, so safely. I mean, it's sort of there, sort of not there. And uh, if, you are, if you are good at it, if you know what you are doing, you can actually force the system to completely forget it. Sounds evil, right? Um, we will come to it, but this is, this is then how it came out. Now uh, hackers are exploiting physics. So this is how uh, electrons are used in uh, the memory structure to store ones and zeros. And uh, the idea is the following. I mean, we will see this later in the lectures. Memories are organized in multiple rows. So each row contains a uh, number of bits in it. So this is how we uh, store information. And if you want to access this memory, you will enable one of this row and uh, either read out something or you will enable the row and tell him, hey, this is your new data. So you enable this row, you read out, you enable this row, you write something new that overrides the old thing. The idea here is a si simple uh, thing. You select this row, you apply a high voltage, open it, write something in it, close it, open it, close it, open it, close it. So you're like continuously, I open, I close, I open, I close, I open, I close. Normally, so what? I'm only dealing with this row. But it turns out that in uh, recent DRAM chips, now this is the interesting part, it wasn't like this. But in newer chips, you realize that uh, you can cause disturbances by continuously reading and writing to one row, and unrelated rows, well, unrelated, neighboring rows get disturbed. 
they lose their values, they lose their data, or you can influence the content of that memory. That is simply crazy. I am reading address 30 and address 65 changes, or I'm opening and closing the door of ETH and University of Zurich, you know, crumbles or something like that. <laughs> what gives? I mean, what's happening? And this is not little. So uh, Professor Mutlu's group did uh, actually looked at three different manufacturers. They don't like to be named, so they are hidden between A company, B company, C company. And uh, you look at how many chips they try, so 43 DRAM modules, not individual chips, 37 of them, so 86%, 83%, 88% had errors, and they didn't have like, you know, one, two errors. This is like 10 to the 7, 10 million errors, 2.7 million errors, 0 0.3 million errors in the DRAM. And if you look at the time scale, so at the beginning, the modules from A and B, I mean from the manufacturing year, they didn't have errors, but this is when things started getting interesting. So uh, when you look at, what is it, uh, 2010, the modules by company C first had this problem. And now you go further, and all of a sudden, ah, voila. And practically nowadays, or after 2011, all of the things that were manufactured show disturbing number of errors where, you know, you can make use of it. Isn't this crazy? I mean, you cannot trust your memory now. You, we couldn't trust our processor. Now we are not trusting our memory. So why is this happening? Um, uh, well, the first thing is, once again, the performance metrics that we put on it. If you go and buy RAM, what's the most important thing you are concerned about? Why do you buy RAM? What's the better RAM? Yes. Sorry? Somebody said speed. Someone else? So if you have like your new um, uh, digital camera and there are two uh, memory cards for it. One is one whatever. 100 megabit per second, and the other one is 200 megabit per second, or do you buy for something else? Yeah? Store space. So the bigger, the better, right? So you want to pay for more memory. And uh, the way the, the, um, the memories are built physically, um, we will come to that. They realize that by, uh, by reducing the sizes, the margins of how data is stored, they could get away with it and make the memory smaller and smaller. One individual memory. If they make one individual memory smaller into the same area, they can pack more storage space. And this motivated them to make those individual cells tinier and tinier. Nobody actually thought that there would be this ridiculous person that comes and toggles, 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 toggles. Who does that, you know? I mean, when you are designing the memory, you are thinking that people that use my memory are reasonable people. They don't have hammers in their hand. Maybe it wasn't the best idea. So uh, the access to one cell uh, affects the value in nearby cells, so this is why this thing is happening. And uh, the... Uh, I mean, you can go into the details, and some of those details are also company confidential. They are not like coming and giving you the exact electrical uh, details of how they do it. But when you activate one row, you apply a high voltage, uh, the adjacent rows get, you know, not completely activated, but just a bit more activated. And vulnerable cells lose a little bit of what they store in, in, their, um, in their cells. So we get a little bit more vulnerable. Now, if you look at how we are uh, working in a computer, uh, this, has, this has a lot of implications. You know, the memory that we taught uh, in, in all our uh, uh, standards that was safe, that we could save something and later retrieve it. And, you know, we could also tell 
some spaces and say these are reserved spaces. With these spaces, we are not going to make any, you know, this is the kernel operation space and this is the user space. Or this is where I store my important data. And now you realize that even if I'm not touching that data, if I'm just doing something on the side, I could lose that data. It's not nice. And uh, you don't need some crazy uh, sophisticated program to, to, uh, to uh, exploit this. What you have to do is to be able to repeatedly write into adjacent or into memory locations. So you want to make sure that you are not going over the cache because the problem now is not in the cache. We will talk about the memory hierarchies more in detail, but for those of you who are interested, we just need to clear the uh, values from the cache, make sure that they are not there. We want to directly access the memory, and uh, we want to uh, avoid this one and then try to read the other one continuously as much as we can. And uh, in the meantime, we are going to influence all these rows around. So they, uh, here are the papers. So these are the things that end up now in your reading uh, in the additional reading assignments, like links to these pa papers where you can read about it, how uh, it was discovered, how it was exploited. They are not meant for a, uh, let's say, first year student uh, reading necessarily, but this is where the problem were discovered, discussed, and explained. So it might be already, uh, for some of you, interesting to look at them just to understand how do we describe the problems, how do we solve them. And you see that. Uh, we can have, since we are not using the cache and we, are, we also have to flush caches continuously, the speeds at which we are accessing are not um, the same rates as you normally do, but they are not little. So, you know, this is a uh, million accesses per second and you can generate 30,000, 15,000 errors in uh, most processors. So, this leads to, I mean, you say, okay, so what? What can I do with this? So you can you can take you can use this vulnerability. So this is one part. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so these errors also happen with non-view, right? You don't have to test. Um, so these errors yes, it's a good question. They are uh, your uh, friend is asking: Is doesn't this normally also occur? Uh, there is a, memories have these problems, reliability problems, therefore there is uh, things like error correction codes used. Sometimes you store additional bits to be able to restore it. Uh, there is also a normal expected behavior and they are tested against that. So you know uh, some things. However, what you're doing here is way above what uh, people thought would happen. So this, this problem, there is maybe a few orders of magnitude difference that you can create, you can artificially create some situation where this problem is exploited. So this is also, if you watch, uh, anybody watch the movie Prestige? Yeah, so a good trick, you know, has these three faces. So this is one of the faces. We use now this, this is a trick to, uh, to uh, we realize there is something and then we have to build around it to make a vulnerability. And you realize, okay, First thing you say, so what? Some bit somewhere, uh, my uh, picture on something has a few bits flipped, so what? But you realize that uh, you can do more with it, and uh, so this is where it ends, you know? Exploiting the DRAM row hammer bug to gain kernel privileges. Yeah? Well, I don't think you need the row hammer to do that, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you could. I mean, it's not, I mean, that's not very useful for an attacker that your system crashes. An attacker usually wants to, I mean, it's not a very, it's a denial of service if you want. You know, it, uh, blue, blue screen of that happens when you, uh, different reasons, but you don't, uh, the, the memory you're trying to access is no longer there and, and things like that. But this thing is serious. Now, just a second, uh, you have a user level program, you are a nobody on your system, and guess what? We are doing a lot of our work on, in the cloud where you know we have virtual platforms, 
where multiple people are running their things. And these things rely on the fact that you could have some privilege levels. There is a supervisor, there is a kernel, and there is like a simple user program. That user program should not have access to the rest of the system. Otherwise, the entire concept of virtualization or the entire concept of having rival companies run and use the same hardware as in, for example, Amazon Web Services, uh, breaks apart. You gain kernel privileges, being that you are the root of the system. It's scary. Sorry, question? No. Yeah? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And for that, I will refer you to the uh, to these uh, two uh, papers. I mean, the paper is there. So in 2015, how do I exploit the DRAM row hammer bug? So this is a problem that I explained. And it's not like, oh, OK, I just do this, and all of a sudden I'm root on the system. It doesn't work quite like that. But they can show you that you can do this, because there are some special memory locations that holds uh, more information. And if you can skillfully manipulate that, I'm not saying that it's the easiest thing to do, but you are able to uh, uh, do this. So you gain kernel privileges uh, when you are an unprivileged user. And uh, what you do is there are the page table entries uh, that map the different regions of the memory. And uh, they were able to gain more elevated access become a more capable process by doing so. And once you have that, the rest is history. Uh, don't get me wrong. This is not like, oh, OK, I press two buttons and it works. Still, the problem is there. It's a vulnerability. It attacks normal chips, normal DRAMs manufactured. And uh, this was the thing breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming neighbor's door until the vibrations opened the door you were after. So if you see some strange character in your corridor, just opening and closing doors, call the police, stop him, say, I know what you're doing. There's nothing in my house. I don't know. And uh, that's not only it. So they, once the idea is out, and this is also the thing, this is a simple idea where you realize, ah, if I repeatedly access the uh, memory, I can influence the bits on the side. People get very creative very fast. So it was also exploited to gain root privileges for web apps. You are remotely accessing a computer, which is running some user level program, and you can skillfully manipulate it and gain access uh, for that. It's scary. And uh, hammer and root, tada, works on Androids. Nobody is shocked. <laughs> it's actually good, you see, because we grew up in a time uh, when we were a little bit more, um, how shall I say, repressed, or we were afraid, we had secrets. Uh, it, was, it was a big deal. But you grew up with the internet, and you are OK with everything is everywhere, everything is shared. I don't care. I don't have secrets. So you know, go ahead, uh, do it, so what? Uh, it's, it's, it's also good. Maybe we don't need uh, so much. But it's not only security. It's not only your privacy that's a concern. It's you are not able to run services. You are not able to provide digital services if you are not able to guarantee that your systems are working the way they are designed to. And this is a problem. Maybe. You can have a different view about your privacy. And uh, you know, there could be things. So uh, this is actually the original paper uh, where, and the original setup uh, where it was discovered. Uh, they needed to control the temperature because the memory behavior is very temperature dependent. Uh, the, there was a heater controlling uh, the temperature on these memory. Uh, memories there. The memories were accessed through FPGAs, which is also the ones that you will be using in your exercises. And now comes the other thing. How do I actually fix this problem? Well, you can say I make better DRAM chips. I refresh more frequently. We'll come to that. Sophisticated error correction, more sophisticated than we had before. 
Or we can have access counters and say, if somebody is accessing this row repeatedly, there's something wrong, let's stop him. What's the problem? Just give me a minute. They don't come for free. So, you know, better DRAM chips cost more or perform worse. More per refresh reduces the performance. Error correction comes at cost and power. Access counters add more uh, complexity. And guess what Apple did, for example? This is their uh, security release. And they said this issue was mitigated by increasing the memory refresh rates. If you know what is happening, if you have more idea what's happening, this will also allow you to find solution that goes very well. Now, uh, let's have a break. And after the break, I'll say a few more words about how, for example, this problem was also fixed by being a bit more smarter about it. So let's continue in 15 minutes. Weekend is almost here. I'm the only thing standing before the weekend. No, do you have another class after this? No, this is the last one. I'm the evil person keeping you away from the weekend. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. So we were uh, looking at the row hammer and we realized that this is actually a problem. And you also realize we will come towards the end of the uh, uh, lecture also to this uh, thing, what they say, this refresh rate. And dynamic memory is kind of funny thing. But you could also then come up with better solutions for this row hammer than these brute force solutions. Remember our problem, now we identified the problem. There could be some evil people that take a hammer and you know, beat your memory rows. And uh, there were some expensive solutions. And the question is, is there something smarter that we can do that still mitigates this? And uh, this is also worked on by Professor Mutlu, so the probabilistic adjacent row activation. It's very difficult in scientific fields to come up with nice acronyms because as the years go by, everybody picks the acronym, so it gets difficult. So this is PARA. Um, the, um, the key idea here is the following. If you are, for whatever reason, clo are closing a row, you are stopping the access to that row, with a very small probability, in this case, uh, you know, less than 1% probability, you uh, refresh one of its neighbors uh, just in case. Just in case the guy who is going to do this w could be this maniac who wants to hammer it. And you don't want to refresh everything. You just say, hey, if I'm closing this row, let me give it a probability. And if with a very, you know, less than 1% of the time, let me just in case refresh the neighbors. Why does this work? Because the problem why row hammer works is when you are accessing one row, the neighboring rows get a bit affected. If you continue, continue to uh, hammer the same row, open it, close it, open it, close it, open it, close it, the neighboring cells eventually lose their values or get destroyed or get jumbled. And uh, by refreshing every now and then, if you, you don't have to refresh all the time, but every now and then, you can uh, reduce the uh, probability of failure in one year to 9.4 times 10 to the minus 14, which is like, it's not going to happen. Or it's also not going to happen in a way that people can take advantage of it. Now, um, this is not such a huge overhead if you think about it. Because what Apple did was they, they in, uh, increased the rate in which the rows are refreshed for everything. Everything got slower. Everything needed more energy. This one says, hey, we are going to make a small change uh, so that uh, this thing does not become an interesting attack vector for, for the people. Uh, there were some questions during the break. I mean, it's like, how can you make sure that uh, the value that you want appears there? You know, you play the probabilities if you can make some changes and you can try it over and over again. And if you can try it infinitely, at some point, the value you look for will be there. And as an attacker, this is, you know, enemy at the gates. Uh, if you are defending your system, you have to make sure that every attacker is rejected. If you're attacking, you can attack as much as you want. The one time you get in, you got in. 
And this makes life very difficult for finding uh, the choices. Now, this, all of a sudden, if, if your memory has this kind of protection, you realize that the chances of you inducing an error within a year is very, very small. So, okay, yes, if, if you are really, really patient, you try it, and if you have a lot, lot of luck, maybe, maybe you could gain some privilege before this guy reboots his machine or does something. But it's no longer attractive. So it's, it's actually uh, makes it uh, there. So now, how can you come up with such a solution? You have to understand where the problem comes from. And if you are just concentrated on your level, you don't have the chance for seeing that. We will see about the refresh in a few minutes. And then uh, to find, to exploit the vulnerability, you have to understand how all things come together. And it doesn't mean that you have to be the ones building it. It doesn't mean that you have to be the electrical engineers building memories or the physicists coming up with new storage capabilities. It just tells you that you need to have this broader understanding of the systems to be able to do more. And uh, if you are really interested, so this is the, where the part is. Um, there, there were some interesting questions. You wanted to know more about Rowhammer and things like that. So this is exactly why uh, there's also a long list of uh, papers and uh, analysis that you can read. It's not, Juan, it's not mandatory, right? These are not mandatory. They don't have to recite them. Not that next lecture, you know, Honor asks somebody to come up here and says, what's wrong, Hammer? <laughs> okay. So, take away once again, breaking the abstraction layers, knowing what is underneath helps you to understand and solve problems. And here is also the important thing that you have to realize. Um, we are in a privileged position. It's a nice university we are. It's a nice country where we are. But uh, the easy pickings are gone. So the easier things that we could do, uh, those jobs are no longer uh, so available. So if you want to be successful, you have to be, uh, and you want to have the salaries that you want to have, uh, you have to be better. We have to do more. So here's another one, another mystery, the memory performance attacks. And uh, this one is actually, uh, has also some, uh, Interesting things. Remember Moore's law? Yes? You're too tired to raise your hands. Uh, Moore's law said that on the same area, every two years, we can put roughly twice the amount of things. And uh, I also told you that there's no point in making the chips very smaller or you cannot make them very larger. That more gives you like a sweet spot of how large a chip should be. It is more of an economical uh, problem. And then people realize they have the silicon area. And um, they get more and more. What shall we do? After a while, they ran out of ideas. You know, there were eight bit processors, and there were 16 bit, 32 bit, 64 bit. And then they said, let's put some cache, let's put some level two cache, let's put this, let's put that. And then they said, let's put more cores. So, modern systems like this, you see there are uh, four cores on it. Not only that, there is a memory hierarchy. So inside the cores, there is already some what we call a level one cache that feeds the data and the instruction um, engines of the cores. And then these ones go one higher level up. So there is a level two cache. Uh, it's a memory hierarchy. And then, not only that, uh, on the chip, there is also all these four cores share the same cache memory before uh, data goes over a DRAM memory controller to an external memory. So inside the chip, you already have, I mean, this could be four megabytes. I mean, it's not huge, but it's actually quite a lot. This could be 256, 512 kilobyte. Inside, there will be smaller memories of 3264 kilobyte or something like that. And your 1664, 128, whatever gigabyte memory will be outside uh, in a separate interface. Now, the trend to add many cores has a lot of motivations. And uh, one of them is what I told you, that uh, once you start putting more and more transistors, uh, you run out of ideas what to do with them, because uh, there is a you know, law of diminishing returns. From 8-bit to 16-bit, it was a wow. 
1632, yes. 3264, oh. And 64 to 128, there's, there's a reason why there's no 128-bit processors, because it doesn't, in most of the cases uh, so far, it was, it, its value proposition wasn't very good. And then they realized that it's actually much better to have systems that have multiple cores. Here there are four, there are eight cores. Uh, this is the PlayStation 3 uh, processor. At the time, it had nine cores. And uh, there are even some crazier, larger things with hundreds of cores uh, actually today being designed. Uh, ETH is actually involved in a European processor initiative. We are designing something that has uh, six, you know, 48 cores or something like that for the next three years. Uh, this has also a good idea because you say instead of making one huge core, it's better to have multiple small cores that are still powerful and uh, use parallelization. The idea is that if you have two cores, you get two times the performance because there are two things working in parallel. And uh, so what happens? So this is an experiment and uh, you realize that when you are in this multi-core uh, system, theoretically, your system has two cores. You give, uh, you are running something on one of the cores and you are running something on, you are running GCC on another core, two separate cores. And you realize that uh, even though you're given low priority to this guy, he's running almost at full speed. There's no slowdown as you go up, it slows down and you gave high priority to this guy, and it's slowing down a lot. That doesn't seem right. It looks like this is speed up, right? No, it's slowing down. They, they noticed this, and it's a, it's a paper by Professor Mutlu, and uh, they say it's a memory performance attack. So what's happening? I mean, it's frustrating. I mean, if you're running this program, you say, hey, I have two programs running side by side. There are two cores. Uh, they are the same type of cores. And if these two run together, one of them runs much slower than the other one. You'll go mad. Or you'll just give up. I don't know. And uh, why is there a disparity in slowdowns if you don't know actually uh, much about what is lying underneath? And if you don't know what is happening, this is a problem, because we are interested, we love problems. Actually, the moment you see something like this, you're saying, yeah, there's an opportunity for me. I have discovered a problem, I will analyze it, and I will make a very nice and uh, clever solution, and um, you know, it will be known as my solution with my name. It's a pity that you know, I'm called Gürkaynak, so you know, if I have ever invented such a solution, they will say, is there another author? They're not going to say the Gürkaynak method. <laughs> so some of you are born lucky. So three questions. Why is there any slowdown? And why is there a disparity in slowdowns? It's not even obvious why there should be a slowdown. There are two cores running parallel, and they shouldn't be interfering with each other. They are running completely different programs. and. Uh, what do you, I mean, what is uh, going on? And um, now the, the problem, like I told you, seemed maybe a little bit arbitrary, right? I mean, MATLAB, GCC, whatever, I'm not interested. However, we are using these multi-core systems everywhere. All cloud computing is done on uh, computers that have multiple processors, and each processor has multiple cores sharing a lot of their resources. Even your mobile uh, phones these days have, uh, have uh, such things. You want not only for your own applications, but most of the time you're even running different applica uh, applications from different users on the same system. And as a system provider, for example, you want to make sure that you can give them um, some guarantees saying that, hey, I bought so many cores from you, and those cores should be the same as the cores that someone else has. Uh, you may want to have different applications. We call quality of service guarantees. If you are doing, for example, a video transmission, uh, you want that a certain number of frames are transmitted or processed. Uh, you can have some processes that are, I mean, it should be executed all the time, but it's okay if we drop every now and then something, like your Skype calls and uh, those that are less important, 
I'm not going to say cat videos. <laughs> and, uh, but what you want is that you, you want um, a controllable system that doesn't necessarily sacrifice all its performance just for the sake of being controllable. So let's go back to the disparity in the slowdowns. This is the system that we were looking. So there are two cores. They have some cache. There is some interconnect. There is a memory connect uh, controller. The green part is our big multi-core chip that the electrical engineering guys built for us. And outside there, there is uh, multiple memory banks that is being accessed and controlled by this memory controller. Now, this part of the system is being shared by the request of these two parts. OK. Seems fair. So we should just make sure that whatever is happening here is fair or arbitrates nicely between the requirements of these two parts. I mean, what should be the issue there? So uh, now the issue that we are having is, again, MATLAB and GCC. And they want to access the memory. And here is the, hopefully the animation. Uh, this guy makes a bunch of requests to the memory. And this guy maybe doesn't make so many requests. And, uh, the, uh, and the guy keeps on sending memory requests and having access to the uh, memories more than this other guy. They, they, his four requests already went there. And this guy is still waiting to be accessed. And, uh, somehow he's not being fair to this red guy. And, uh, you know, it's continuously the blue guy accessing the memory before the red guy uh, gets to do something. So we discover, just by ex experiments, that this person is being unfair, evil. Now you are really, really upset. And now we have to go maybe a little bit deeper into how DRAM works. Uh, we are still going to cover this in the lecture. So this is not the lecture where we are teaching the details about memory operations. Still, uh, this much I can tell, the memory is organized in columns and rows. So if you have a million bits that you store, you distribute them in this two-dimensional array. And uh, the, uh, this is, I mean, in reality, it's a bit more complex than that. But what happens is that you have a row buffer. Because technically, if you think about it, your memory locations will have 32 or 64 bits. If you made like this array extremely high, because you have, I don't know, uh, one gigabyte or uh, something like that, uh, you don't want to have a 1 billion bits by 64 bits array. It's much better if the array is a bit more squarish, let's say. It's a, more efficient structure. So what you do is at one time, you access uh, one row, which doesn't contain only your word, but it contains multiple words at the same time, multiple sizes of the words. So once you make an access and you say, I want to see this row zero, column zero, whatever, what actually happens is uh, you tell him, I want the row address zero. It goes to a row decoder. This says, hey, the array, I want the zero row. And he activates the entire row, regardless of what the columns, and just copies it down here into the row buffer. Now, we know that the data you're looking for is this first one, the row zero, column zero. And it's already in here. And then you can service it from there. And uh, there is this part that selects, OK, I have the entire row. We select which column we want. And then we have the data, and it goes up. Simple enough. Now. If you want to access in the same row, the same column, you don't need to go to the row decoder again, because you know that it's in the row buffer. I recently made an access. I read the entire row 0. So all the columns that belong to row 0 are already here. And I don't need to wait for this being activated. You say, ah, there is, it's already in the row. I'll just pick the column. I'll take it out. And uh, row 0, column 85, whatever. It's also here. I'll read it. Ta-da. It goes out. And now once you go to the row 1, column 0, you know, assuming that you're going through your memory linearly, now in this time, you say, oops, I want row 1. I recently read only row 0. So I have to go and refresh my row. And uh, I will read something else. 
and now I apply row one, row one goes down there. Everybody still with me? Okay. <laughs> Why did we animate it so long? Okay. So, uh, key idea here is if the, if the uh, data that you're looking for in this RAM organization, simplified RAM organization, is in the uh, same role than you did before, you can read it much faster. It's much more efficient to complete the accesses to the same row first. And uh, current memory controllers try to take advantage of that. Why? Because they want to look good. You don't want to buy a memory controller that says, I'll give you one megabyte per second RAM access. You want to go and find this one and saying, I want one terabyte per second, whatever access. And the only way that this is going to happen is if you aggressively tune your system to take advantage of everything that is good and nice. So you realize that there's a row buffer, and uh, the most common scheduling uh, policy tries to uh, give priority if there are multiple requests outstanding request, it gives priority to the one that uh, is already in the row that, that is uh, accessed. So this scheduling policy is really good to increase your throughput. It's not really nice if you are trying to do something else. So uh, the DRAM scheduling policy is unfair towards some applications. It is, uh, it is, it prioritizes apps with higher row buffer locality, and other parts of it prioritizes memory intensive applications over ones that don't. So now, if you have this RAM controller in there, and you, have, uh, you can run your programs there, just by manipulating it, writing a specific program, you can slow down the rest of the system. So this is what was happening here. This little code, has a sequential memory access. It has very high row buffer locality, which means that it's reading data one after another one. The other one needs somehow to access some data at random, uh, sometimes reading for here, sometimes reading from here. There are a lot of algorithms that require this for some reason or the other. Anyway, its memory accesses are random. So from the algorithm, you already know that there is going to be some problems with it. But you say, OK, I still realize this is good. And it would still be good. However, now comes the evil uh, memory controller. It's not evil. He, he was designed for something else. And he prioritizes the guy. So this is the red process. This is the blue process. He wants row 16, but I have row 0 in it. And then the next request, he's looking ahead in the request. He says, ah, there is something in row 0. Before I close row zero and go and pick row 16, let me service this. And oops, that's there. Now comes row 111 and says, okay, ah, another row zero. So let me do the row zero. And then oops, and then another row zero. Yoo-hoo, I'm hitting, you know, we are delivering. And uh, you know, this goes, and uh, this goes, and this goes. And if you look at the modern thing, oh, sorry, I have to, what was the rate? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. In this case, the row size was 8 kilobytes, so uh, one of these rows contains 8 kilobytes. The requests were 64-bit words, uh, and uh, there were 128 requests of the blue stream were serviced before a single request of this guy was there. Now, the problem is the blue one could be an attacker, the red one would be the legitimate user of the system, and you could create something that unfairly hogs the memory to slow down your opponent. Bad and evil. So here is also the question, where do we solve this problem? You know, where does it occur? How can I attack this problem? How can I solve this problem? And then you realize it has to be a little bit in the microarchitecture, maybe a little bit in the logic that we are implementing it. And uh, this is, again, one of those uh, goals of this course, to make you aware that the problems we are facing today, the problems that we expect you to solve in your professional career, will require you to think critically and broadly. 
It's not the president thinks, it's the principles that you have to learn and look at it. So if you're really interested, uh, you can read about it. Again, it's in the reading list, uh, these, uh, these works. The same takeaways, again, we are breaking the abstraction layers. It wasn't only memory processor and, and things, it was also how the scheduling was going on and why uh, making a row buffer made sense in this case. One more mystery. Yay. <laughs> A little yay. Okay, let's talk about the DRAM because I, I left this to the end so we can uh, finally also see what is happening in the DRAM. And uh, you also see the principle. So we are back to the same uh, system here, memory system. And we want to see, talk about this DRAM. DRAM stands for dynamic RAM. And we will talk about this once again, we will cover it in class. Uh, DRAM is the simplest memory that you can make. This thing, this is this mysterious transistor that we were talking about, the one that Moore was fantasizing about. And uh, this one is a single capacitor. A capacitor actually is two conducting plates isolated by an insulator, okay? Two metal plates, it, it stores some charge. The way it works is, uh, you can think of this transistor as a switch. When you activate the switch, you close the connection here, and whatever voltage electrons are on the bit line get transferred over this capacitor. And then if you want to store it, you now open the switch, so whatever charge you brought in here stays here. Simple enough. And when you want to read it out, all you want to do, all you have to do is, Close the switch again, and there are two cases. Either we store some electrons, we store some charge there, and then we can see a higher voltage level somehow electrically, or there was nothing stored there and we don't read something out. Brilliant idea. We like this a lot because it gives us a lot of density. One transistor, one bit of memory. You know, we were talking about 10 billion transistors in a chip. So if you want to do that analogy, 10 billion bits in a chip. Ha! It has a um, slightly uh, problem, like all good things. Anybody know what the problem is? Yes? Yeah, that's correct. So what your colleague said, you have to refresh this capacitor. It's just kind of strange. We, you know, convince some electrons to go there and, you know, look at each other across the plates. So, you know, the, the electrons are, there's an electric field here, and they are, like, looking at the other side and saying, oh, I want to go there, and they stay there. And technically, if this was a perfect insulator, and if this was a perfect switch, they would stay there forever. There is no such thing. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, this insulator, because you make them very small, leaks every now and then a few electrons escape. This switch is not a perfect uh, isolation. Some of the electrons run away from here. So if you wait long enough, it's like burying treasure somewhere, and like a year later you come and dig it up, and you realize there's nothing in there. It's really annoying. <laughs> and so we call it dynamic RAM because the uh, guy is good, he can recognize a lot of things, it just cannot remember them forever. Actually, it cannot remember them for very long, so periodically, and this happens in all your computers, the entire content of the memory is read out once and written back again. Okay? So imagine me at the beginning of lecture, every lecture I tell you the same things once again. I ask you, what's your name? And then I tell you, this is your name. And then every hour I repeat the same situation again and again. This is how DRAM works. It was a good compromise, actually, because why? We wanted to have a lot of density. You will see we have different types of memories that never forget something. Guess what? They are bigger, much bigger. They use six transistors, six. Then sometimes, oh, it's okay, I'll deal with the refreshing situation. So the, uh, the charge is stored on the capacitor and you have tens and thousands of rows. 
and the capacitor leaks over time, so you need some controller while you are not accessing the memory, or you have to go and read out every row, replace it, read, replace, read, replace, and go through you know, the entire 16, 64 gigabyte of memory you have in your computing system. And, uh, well, how do you calculate this? Uh, there is some physics behind it. Why is there some leakage? And then you have to guarantee that you are not losing any data because, you know, you have to have some guarantees. And uh, it's a very typical number, 64 milliseconds. We like these numbers. They are round. Do you agree with that, round numbers? Powers of two? Don't try this at a restaurant like I did. I had once a bill, it was 128 francs, and I said, wow, such a round number. She looked at me and said, no, it's not. <laughs> and, you know, everybody at the table, we were like, wow, cool, two to the seven. <laughs> Geeks. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, you, you start with a value that, that works well, and then that value becomes the target design. You realize, hey, I can work with this number, and you do it. The downside of the refresh is, first of all, it's ridiculous. You are reading out the entire memory, uh, roughly, I mean, 20 times per second, and writing it back again for no apparent reason. You know, while this screen didn't change, this moment, the computer technically didn't do anything. Its memory was already refreshed a thousand times now. It's <laughs> work, and this means energy, and it's wasting it away. And I didn't even plug it in. Oh, okay. Let's, let's continue. The other thing is performance degradation, because why? The moment I'm, I'm refreshing the memory, I'm not able to use the memory as I want to. Why? Because, hey, while I'm refreshing it, I cannot also read and write to the same memory location because it's busy refreshing. And uh, the, this has a problem on the predictability. You will see this uh, if you are interested in, in those things uh, later in your studies, uh, safety critical systems like in airplanes, in cars, in automated uh, driver assistance systems and things like that. You want to have systems that have very predictable execution times. When a child runs in front of your car, you want to be able to tell people that my sensors, my system will react in five milliseconds. And not, well, it will mostly react in five milliseconds, but sometimes there might be this rotating <laughs> icon there. So uh, these are all causes of this. So um, first, some analysis. Uh, and this is the homework. So imagine a system with one exabyte DRAM. A lot. So kilo, mega, giga, tera, exa, peta. OK, a lot of bytes, 2 to the 60 bytes. And imagine that we have a row size of 8 kilobytes. So we are storing 2 to the 13 bytes in, our, uh, in one row. How many rows do you have? If you say a lot, yeah? How much is that? Do you know the trick? So 2 to the 10 is 1,000, right? <laughs> OK, there's a trick in case you don't know. 2 to the 10 is roughly 1,000. So if you say 2 to the 20, it's roughly 1 million. 2 to the 40 is roughly 1 million times 1 million. And then you have 2 to the 7. You don't remember the waitress? 128. No? Easy tricks. OK. So how many refreshes do happen in 64 milliseconds? Maybe that number. And uh, what is the total power consumption of a DRAM refresh in this large memory? And you can do and do the calculation. And uh, what's the total energy consumption of the DRAM per day? So it's, it's a fun exercise because, you know, at, at the moment your computers do not have exabyte memories. But, you know, do this. 
just look at the numbers, and then you will think, oh, no, maybe I made a mistake. Uh, and then do it again, and then you realize, oh, okay, uh, this is a problem. So if you look at uh, two problems, right? So these are the device capacities, 2 gigabytes, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. These are of individual chips. And uh, you see that at the moment you are spending about 8% of your time refreshing the memory instead of doing what it is supposed to do about 10% of the time. And if it goes on like this, at some point, half the time, the memory is not a memory, it's just trying to remember, like, remember, remember, remember. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. And it's not, only the, uh, it's not only the availability, it's also uh, the amount of energy, uh, amount of the total energy that you are spending is actually much worse. And uh, how can we solve this problem? Or can we solve this problem smartly? Uh, of course, you can go and ask the technology guys to somehow make capacitors that don't leak. Or you can say, let's not make RAM so large. You know, 640 kilobytes ought to be enough for everybody. Why do you use it? Don't do it. 4K videos, no. Quarter VGA. You realize those things are not going to fly, right? Okay, so, the, the observation is that I told you, and you know, I didn't even tell you why, I said there's like some historical context, I refreshed every 64 milliseconds. And say, really, all of them? Do we really need to refresh them? I mean, we can understand that there are some leaky, uh, problematic people, but do really, are all of them so uniformly bad? Or maybe did the people who are designing the RAMs calculate the worst of the worst case probability over a large statistical distribution and said, you know what, if we do it in 64 milliseconds of all the chips that I ever sell, of all the bits they have, we will have no problems. Were they taking the easy way out? And um, so now if you look from, from the software point of view, memory is memory. They have an address, there's some data, you read it, you access it, you write it, End of story. But now, the question is, can we actually look more into it, and can we maybe realize some things, and also expose this control to the upper layers, to the software, and be smarter about it? Because why? We may realize that we have different types of data. Just like you define a structure in your program, you, you build your data structures, you may be aware of some data which is, you know, more important than the others. All data are equal, some data are more equal than others. No, seriously, 1984? Oh, yeah. Reference, reading. <laughs> okay. So, the uh, overall retention profile of a DRAM was put to 64 milliseconds. If you actually go and make an experiment, and the experiment is very simple. You cancel the refresh rate, you read the memory content, and you see when does it actually lose its values. You will see and realize this. There is this, at the very top, the tiny part that can only retain its value for 64 to 128 milliseconds. There is a tiny part that can retain or needs to be refreshed within 128 to 256 milliseconds. The vast majority of your RAM can actually, does not need to be refreshed for a very long time. And uh, why, why? Well, there is one trick. You want to make like these tiny, tiny transistors and uh, you know, put a lot of them side by side and uh, you, ha you put margins. And these margins uh, are there because the manufacturing is not perfect. There's bound to be variations in the way it's being manufactured. And the people who sell the chips want to be on the very, very, very safe side. It's just like when you drive over a bridge here in Switzerland, sometimes you see this number, like it says three and a half tons. Weren't you ever, you know, like what happens if I drive over it with 3.6 tons? Like will the bridge collapse? It won't, okay, don't do it. 
but you know, th those people probably design it for 10 times the load, but they still say, don't go over it for more than 3.5. Like, you know, there's a 3.5 ton car passing and it starts raining, gets wet and collapses. No. <laughs> Too late for jokes. Okay, I'll stop it, don't worry. <laughs> so some cells are more leaky than the others, and uh, this is uh, the manufacturing process variation. And this thing gets worse the smaller we make the transistors. Remember, Moore was forcing us to put more and more transistors. We make them tinier, tinier, tinier. And the tinier we make, the more variation they have, and the more uh, we have to put these margins so that they are operational. So there is an opportunity, if you know it, um, that we can take advantage of it. Now, if we were, magically, if in every computer, we, we don't know we cannot say this for all memories, but if I have my memory in my system, I can profile it. I can maybe run a small analysis of my memory, first with 64 milliseconds refresh, and I can determine the retention time of everything in my system, maybe during boot time, and store it somewhere. And if I know this, I can maybe do something. I can expose this information to something, and uh, I can do more. I don't need to refresh as much. So once again, the problem comes actually, or the, the issue lies here at the devices, and maybe a little bit in the logic that controls them. But what we want to do is we want to expose it all the way to the runtime system, the operating system, the, uh, the controlling the virtual machine, and uh, to make sure that at the operating system level, you have this information, and you can expose it to the later layers. So uh, this was done experimentally. So you look at how many, uh, how many rows have failure probabilities after how much time of uh, refresh, and you generate a profile. And then you try to say, without so much cost, without so much effort, is there a way that I can take advantage of it? And the uh, answer is, Actually, yes, because you realize in a 32 gigabyte DRAM, only about 1,000 rows need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. However, at the moment, you're refreshing all of them, but only 1,000. I mean, 1,000 is a tiny, tiny portion of this. So the, uh, the work that was again done by Professor Mutlu is uh, Raider. You could have a good business selling uh, acronyms to researchers. Eliminating unnecessary DRAM refreshes is uh, the same thing. So uh, you need to somehow generate a profile, identify the retention time. You um, store the rows according, I mean, you bin them. It's not like you need to know, does this guy need 67 milliseconds or 68? You say, OK, this is 64, this is 128, this is 256, and this one forever. And uh, then, so this is the profile that you get. And then you somehow use some magic, which I'm not explaining right now, because we have only two minutes left. Uh, and with a tiny overhead, in this case, less than two kilobytes added to the system, you can have a refresh controller that refreshes the memory at different rows at different times. Uh, what's the result? So this is the, uh, this is the hardware overhead, 1.25 kilobytes within 32 gigabytes, practically nothing. But the refresh reduction is 75%. So uh, the uh, DRAM in energy reduction of the overall system is already remarkable, 16%. And uh, overall, of the entire system, you're also improving the performance just by doing this thing. I mean, you're adding to 32 gigabytes of memory some little hardware, less than 0. Point something percent. And overall, you can already get a 10% improvement. Don't laugh at 10%, because every time you want to compare improvements in hardware, think about something like your weight, your salary, or something like this. 10% increase is it's quite good, you know? I mean, if it comes for such a uh, little thing. So if you're interested, once again, 
Uh, the course website will have references and links to it. Takeaways are the same. Uh, it is important, I mean, this is the uh, takeaway of everything. There is a cooperation between multiple layers, and this can enable more efficient uh, solutions and systems. So this is, uh, let me just, everybody's running away. <laughs> so I hope I was able to motivate you why uh, looking at the problems at a broader scale are interesting. And I was hopefully also able to motivate you what you will learn in this lecture and why it should help you. Because this lecture will expose those lower hierarchy levels that you normally, in your, uh, for the rest of your career, will not be directly exposed to. But being able to know and understand what's below will help you. So hope to see you, most of you, in the lectures and also in the exercises. And uh, we will start with the lectures and honestly in the uh, next week. Have a nice evening.